Hello everyone and a very warm welcome back to the Global Diaspora Summit 2022. Nosy and I are delighted to be with you once again and we thank you once again for your patience as you know at these conferences. Those last minute negotiations can take a little bit of time but we're delighted to be back with you. Delighted indeed, Devil, and what a rich and rewarding day we had yesterday. And so as we throw to this afternoon, we'll be seeing participating countries who will be given an opportunity to reflect on the political outcome document. The Dublin Declaration is a set of commitments that represent the firm belief in diaspora engagement as a long-term force for impact across all of the sustainable development pillars and represents our understanding that a future agenda of global action in diaspora engagement can emerge. And so today we'll also be discussing the next steps in view of both the forthcoming International Migration Forum Review in New York and the next Global Diaspora Summit in 2026. And remember that that your participation really matters. So do please send us your questions and observations by using the chat function on Zoom, or just raise your hand if you're here with us in the room in the glorious St. Patrick's Hall. To those delegates who are joining us online and who wish to take part in the general discussion on the political outcome document, raise your hand on Zoom, making sure to identify your name, your title, and your country or organization. You can also, as always, join the conversation online, as many of you have, using the hashtag GDA. GDS Dublin. That's GDS Dublin. So without further ado, let's get that general discussion underway. And once again, let us welcome back Colin Brophy, TD, Ireland's Minister for Overseas Development, Aid and Diaspora. We also extend a very warm welcome back to the Deputy Director General of the IOM, Yugochi Daniels. Colleagues, uh, we're coming to the end of what has been actually two days here and a total of three days of, I believe, rich and stimulating discussion and exchange. Uh, we now have a very clear idea of how we can move forward on creating an environment in which diasporas are further enabled to maximise their contribution to development. We are not reinventing the wheel. Migrants and diasporas, millions of men and women, already make a significant contribution to both their countries of destination and origin. Rather, what we are doing is building on a solid base of sharing best practices, identifying areas where we can do better, and committing to making effective diaspora engagement a reality. So today is the starting point for a new diaspora-specific approach to migration. As current events show us, we as governments need to match the tremendous efforts being made across the world by our diasporas in response to crisis. Here in Europe, we see all that is being done by the Ukrainian diaspora to support shelter and welcome to millions of their compatriots who have been so cruelly forced from their homes. Similar actions have been taken by diasporas the world over. And I value the experiences that those of you who have gathered here have shared with us over the last three days. There's no hierarchy when it comes to human suffering and our obligation to respond to it. So a key lesson that we have learned is that creating a world in which migration is safe, orderly and regular is not something that governments can do alone. Creating a world in which migrants and diasporas are empowered to contribute to development is not something that governments can do alone. Shaping a world in which migrants and migration are seen as positive assets not as threats, is not something that governments can do alone. So that is why a key outcome of our summit is the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, bringing together all the relevant stakeholders from across government, academia, civil society, and also the private sector. Each of these groups has a different perspective, a unique set of experiences, and a wealth of knowledge to bring to the table. Diasporas are, by their nature, diverse. They originate from and live in countries all around our world. They all face unique challenges and there is much they can share and learn from each other. So in the Dublin Declaration, we commit to promoting and facilitating the connections which make such learning possible. We're recognizing that these overlapping sets of connections are an incredibly important resource. Building on them, we can better address the substantive issues to which we are committed to find tangible, effective solutions. How we can best leverage the economic capital of migrants and diasporas, 
What more can we do to build the capacity of diaspora organisations? How can we improve and crucially communicate the data on what diasporas already contribute and what can be made to work better? How to ensure that the women and men who make up the world's diasporas are engaged with and involved in addressing the major challenges that this world faces, including conflict and also climate change? So how do we counter the misleading narratives that foster fear and hostility with true and inspiring stories of what migrants and diasporas have achieved and can achieve? What must we do to combat the xenophobia and discrimination and social exclusion that prevent migrants and diasporas from reaching their full potential to contribute to development? We here in Ireland have seen the great value of direct engagement with our diaspora on all of these issues. The benefits that both they and we gain from the relationship extends across all aspects of our society, supporting the well-being of our people at home and also abroad. We also have a shared obligation of members of the International Organisation for Migration. Our responsibility towards migrants are those of migrant origin who find themselves in situations of vulnerability. It is both of these perspectives which our diasporas can do for us and what we can do for them that have informed our approach to this summit and its outcome. I believe we've achieved much over the past days and I want to thank you all for your contributions. So I will now hand over to the Deputy Director General Daniels of the IOM to let you continue on. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Minister Brophy. Excellencies, and, and, there, and dare I say friends, over the last few days, and in fact, the last several weeks, we as IOM have had the real distinct pleasure and honor to work with our partners in the Irish government to support and facilitate active and very lively discussions about the important and ever more recognized role of the diaspora as development and humanitarian actors. We've heard your regional perspectives through the consultations that took place through last month where many common themes arose. We've worked with the various delegations gathered here and in the virtual space to bring together what is in common into the strategic points laid out in the future agenda document to pave the way toward achieving together objective 19 of the Global Compact on Migration. And I really want to stress the point together. There's been a lot of active engagement negotiation between um, last night and getting, that has got us all here. The, the thing about negotiation and achieving consensus is you never get 100% of what everybody wants, but you do get what is most important for us all um, in the document. And I really want to appreciate all of you um, for your efforts um, and for your commitment to consensus um, in this regard. The future agenda and the participatory and collaborative way in which it was arrived at means to multiply and accelerate our action in support of Objective 19 and to address the common issues we've identified. And there's been extensive discussion about the contributions of the diaspora beyond remittances. We've talked at length about how to involve them in national processes. We've highlighted the import, well, you have highlighted the importance of engaging second and third generation diaspora. But we've also not, again, you, I keep saying we, but it's, it's really all of you um, gathered here and online, but we've also not shied away from the very real challenges that the diaspora face, whether it's discrimination, racism, um, xenophobia. And I think that reflects the reality of the situation that uh, our, our diaspora are dealing with. But more importantly, the commitment to charting the way forward despite the challenges and recognizing the extreme potential to be harnessed from the diaspora. 
So this is an exciting moment, the beginning of a new way of seeing migrant and diaspora communities and our work to empower them, not only through the lens of their individual efforts, but through the potential of broad-based cooperation. This is the beginning. We still have a long road and a lot of work ahead of us, but we believe that we are setting a solid foundation for successful collaboration today. So on this note, I would simply like to really reiterate my deep appreciation to all the delegates who have dedicated their time in person and online across many time zones to be part of this process and to take part in this moment. Of course, we must give a very special thanks to our Irish hosts, without which, or without whose generosity and dedication, none of this would be possible. So thank you, thank you very much. And also, um, for me personally, in this role, um, which, uh, and I'm in this role newly, I am very keen and can, uh, and also on behalf of the DG, of the Director General, to reiterate IOM's firm commitment to supporting what we have agreed to, not only in this document, but we, what we have also agreed to take forward into the International Migration Review Forum um, in May in New York, but more importantly, how we together will ensure that through the diaspora and with the diaspora, we will firm, firmly be on the path to sustainable development for all. Thank you very much.